Welcome to a Sweet Saver Bible School. Thank you for watching. My name is James Reinars, and this is a clip from a Zoom class I taught recently on the history of Christian hymns, with a focus on singing devotionally. There were several parts to the class, but these clips are just of the lecture portion. More information can be found in the description. Similar cool way, we are going to look at not a person this time, but kind of a movement. This is unique. Next semester, we'll cover several other movements, but for, for this semester, this is our first movement, not a person. So the Keswick Convention. This is, um, oh, I might have forgotten my geography. Keswick is a town, obviously, in the mountains right off of a lake. Uh, I believe it's right on the border of England and Scotland. I actually can't remember. I think it's in England, but it's like right on the border. Um, the Keswick Convention was a, con uh, a yearly conference, summer conference that was held uh, first since 1875 in this beautiful valley, and then uh, continues until this date. This is a super long-standing we uh, one weeks or several weeks summer Bible conference. And, um, you know, the hallmark of this movement uh, can be, you know, put together in a, a kind of a doctrine called sanctification by faith. And we'll get into that a little bit. It's a holiness or a higher Christian life focus that we should live a holy life, but not out of our works, but sourced in our faith that draws life from Christ. And they had a super nerdy tagline uh, that came, became a slogan of the conference, but this represents their theological struggle and what they are providing a solution for. How do I, have, how do I live a holy life? Not by suppression, not by eradication of sin, uh, but counteraction. Uh, it doesn't quite roll off the tongue, but it shows that they're battling different concepts, right? Uh, how do I live a holy life? Well, some, some would view the Holy Spirit just uh, overpowers you and suppresses the sin tendency. Uh, it's more of a Calvinistic view. Uh, sin eradication, uh, that if you just really have enough faith, the Lord just yanks all of sin out of you. That's a holiness and somewhat a Methodist view. Um, and then counteraction is something else. It's kind of like standing up amidst gravity. There's sin in your life, but the life of Christ in you overpowers that, overcomes. We'll get into that a bit more. Um, again, this is a study of a movement. There is not one central figure for us to learn about. We'll talk about several people, and if we get into history next class, we'll talk about even more people. Um, it it's, it's, comes together in a few, but it's really diffuse, kind of a grassroots organic movement that became summed up in this one conference in Keswick. Um, also, with our study of hymns, this is not uh, like a landmark stepping forward in the, the progress of congregational singing or a style of music, as we have seen with Isaac Watts or Charles Wesley, but there's a really unique characteristic or set of features to songs uh, written by, again, not one person, but the many who attended Ke uh, the Keswick Convention and were affected by this, this movement. Uh, they, they kind of have a common string of features and uh, as we begin to look in, at, at who is here, and I just began to realize there's so many hymns that I'm familiar with, so many hymns that I love uh, that are written by people in a connection to Keswick, but it, it's so spread out that I never would have noticed it before. So a lot of our favorite hymns are like this. So in their very first year, I think the year before the Keswick Convention, this group, James Mountain and uh, Evan Roberts, Evan Hopkins' wife, Sorry, I did know her name at one point, but this book just has her as the wife, right? Uh, they put together the first uh, hymnal of this sort that was used in the first Keswick Convention, Hymns of Consecration and Faith. Uh, if you look in the hymnal, there are many tunes to songs that we sing, uh, where the tune is by James Mountain. He was a musician, uh, not a writer, but a musician. But look at these songs. These are examples of songs uh, that were uh, influenced by this channels only, many of us may know. Nothing between, oh Lord, nothing between, within the veil. Oh, the bitter shame and sorrow. What a nice title. The, they, yeah, that is thy mighty love. Oh God, constraineth me. I cannot breathe enough of these. These are great songs. Jesus, I am resting, resting. Hudson Taylor's famous, uh, favorite hymn learned at the Keswick Convention, I believe. Uh, these are all examples of uh, great songs that are uh, sourced in this movement. So we'll set the scene a little bit for what is going on in the 1800s uh, that um, kind of where Keswick was uh, the answer. There was a real stirring up of a lot of um, uh, 
uh, frustration with a, with a dull Christian life, laxity in the church, little spiritual reality. And this was not unique to a small group. Actually, there were many movements at this time trying to shake the church up, bring life into the church. And this was a, this, this list is specifically in the established church in England. Um, but there were three reactions over the century about how to change and, and invital, revitalize the church. There's the kind of high church party. Uh, these are people who are really into the establishment, and they um, they desired to breathe life into the church by a return to Catholic ritualism. Let's just make the rituals better. Let's get fancier robes. Let's teach people about, maybe let's even bring back some Latin. Let's teach people about why the priest swings the incense to the right and then the left, you know, gravity, whatever. But they were just kind of really pe bringing people into the rituals, right? Uh, that in the moment, in the experience of worship in that setting, wow, they could, they could be revitalized. They could feel something. Um, there was a broad church party. I'm not, I'm not, who knows if they took this, um, but they had a desire to, again, with the same goal, but their method was to be as inclusive of, as possible of all the different variety of Christians represented in English. And they specifically sought to bring, uh, to focus on social reforms in, in politics in England and Scotland and Wales, try to make life for everyone better through the church. And they also began to adopt a lot of, um, with this kind of inclusive mindset, began to adopt some of the uh, liberalism and theology coming out of Germany. And, uh, you know, Darwinism was just really affecting a lot of the people's theology. So this, um, you can see how they maybe became really broad, maybe too broad. Uh, this last is what was called the, affectionately, I'm sure, called the Low Church or the Evangelical Party. This is the same group of, of really, um, say, pious evangelicals, uh, Anglicans that we've been talking about, John Newton, William Cooper, Francis Havergal. They stressed simplicity in worship, genuine conversion, born-again experience, and they really put the sermon, not the ritual, at the center of the meeting, and they focused on uh, Bible teaching, not talking about society, not talking about politics, but talking about the Bible. So these are three different uh, ways people in the century were trying to bring life to Christians around them. There were two other influences outside of the established church. In the middle of the century, a group called the Plymouth Brethren, brothers, brothers who first started gathering in Plymouth in England, um, they were a small group, but very unique, very distinct. We'll cover them in two weeks, I believe, next semester. Um, the one book I, I was reading just made this comment. They had an outsized influence. They're very small in number, but man, their books traveled the world and had, they, they were louder, louder than their size. They really had an impact, again, in having more of a holy life, uh, practical church practice away from ritualism, focused on the Lord himself and his prerogatives, and uh, focusing on the Bible. And then at the end of the century, D.L. Moody and Ira Sankey came to England they had been stirring up all kinds of revival in America, and their first uh, trip to London was just something um, England had, and Europe had never seen before. The unprecedented magnitude, size of the campaigns, of the people they would fit into rooms, pe what people would turn out for, and the thousands who were converted, this really um, stirred up the whole spiritual life, but kind of galvanized so much that was a frustration before. Um, and even if uh, beyond those who were converted, many, many more just came as Christians and their lives were quickened, right? So right at the, at, as D.L. Moody and Iris Sankey are, are kind of, I don't know, putting the icing on the cake of stirring up so much spiritual fervor, uh, other forces that were focused not on the gospel, but on higher, a higher Christian reality among Christians were coming together to capitalize on all that D.L. Moody <clears throat> and Iris Sankey stirred up this next group could come kind of in their wake. This is a higher life movement. Uh, this goes by a lot of terms, holiness movement. Out, out of this comes, you know, A.B. Simpson was a big person of the holiness movement. After this, charismatic movement, Pentecostal movement come out of this. But in the early 1800s, uh, mid 1800s, it was called higher life. And uh, we will focus firstly on these two Americans, Robert Pearsall Smith and Hannah Whitehall Smith. Um, they, uh, you know, just lived as uh, traditional Americans. Uh, I think they were uh, they were Quakers in background, Presbyterians in practice, but not really born again until d uh, well into their marriage. Eight years into their marriage, they both experienced a real conversion with Christ. <clears throat> Neither of them were uh, whatever, you know, pastors or theologians or had ever really done anything in Christian ministry. They were 
business people, but very gifted teachers and thinkers and writers. Um, so they began to be very active as lay people once they were born again. Um, and they quickly realized that the religion that they had found seemed to provide perfectly for their future deliverance from sin, but did not seem to give them present deliverance from its power. They began to realize, well, I know that I'm a child of God. My, my repeated failures does not bring me to question my salvation, but how come I can't live as a child of God? How come I continually, you know, sin and then feel bad about it and then repent and then make commitments to the Lord that I won't do it again and then try to live a better life. And then I just rinse and repeat, right? Rinse and repeat. And um, uh, the wife, uh, Hannah Will Smith, uh, even asked an older sister, kind of asked some other people like, you know, am I missing something? I've been reading the Bible. Am I missing something? Is this all I should come to expect from my Christian life? And at that time, the answer she got was like, no, 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 that you haven't missed anything. This is what we're all dealing with. And this is what we all should come to expect. We're all going to die and go to heaven and things will be better then. Right. Uh, not, she couldn't find help for a long time. Um, so in the 1860s, again, they've been married, I think 10, 12 years now. Um, two friends of different backgrounds helped her discover. And I've decided, I've tried to, as much to quote her own words. Um, and I'm focusing a lot really on her specific experience. We won't get into too many other people's stories today, but this gives you a little flavor of what um, the people at this time were, were seeking to bring to Christians abroad. Okay, so these two friends helped her. Just, uh, the way of victory over sin was by faith. And she experienced what she called a second blessing, second blessing of fullness in the Holy Spirit. She found that by committing her daily life, as well as her future destiny to Christ, she found that he gave her deliverance from the power of sin, as well as from its guilt. And it wasn't, uh, this is her words, um, kind of a longer quote. And then after that experience, she went home to her husband, and he kind of thought she was maybe going off to of some kind of heresy or something like she's like, no, 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 I'm just trying to, I'm experiencing what's in the Bible. Let's read Romans 6. I'm no, no longer a slave to sin, you know? She, she was bringing him to some things she had touched in the word. And this is, these are her com comments after her husband also came to experience what she was experiencing. It was not that either he or I considered ourselves to have become sinless or that we never met with any future failures. We had simply discovered the secret of victory and knew that we were no longer the slaves of sin and therefore forced to yield to its mastery but that we might, if we could, be made more than conquerors through our Lord Jesus Christ. But this, this did not mean that temptations ceased to come, and when we neglected to avail ourselves of the secret, we had, this, and instead of handing the battle over to the Lord, we took it into our own hands as of old, failure inevitably followed. So she definitely experienced a, a something just very new of walking with Christ, being filled with the Lord, uh, being delivered from habitual sins and overpowering temptations that she she had just thought was was normal, um, but it wasn't like sin was eradicated. That was that. It's not suppression. It's not eradication. But by consecrating oneself, yielding themselves fully over to Him, and uh, dealing with uh, known sin, uh, Christ was able to be close to them in an overcoming and a victorious way. They uh, began to teach about this in the U.S., and one of Pearsall Smith's mentors, W.E. Broadman, was also one a real teacher of this. Well, that's the end of our section. You can learn more about a Sweet Saber Bible School on our website, link in the description. There you can find course descriptions and find out how you can join the next class. And for now, I'll say thank you. Thank you so much for watching. May Jesus bless you, and may we become a saver that is pleasing to our God.